Could it be that hidden within this simple description, the answers to the skeptic's most difficult questions may be found? Having served as director of one of the United States Defense Department's major research and development laboratories, Dr. Walter Brown comes with an impressive list of credentials and credibility. In tackling the subject of Earth's geological development, Dr. Brown has developed a theory that contradicts the generally accepted viewpoint of the scientific community. Profound and far-reaching, this respected scientist's hydroplate theory not only offers a completely new approach to the geological sciences, it succeeds where the prevailing theory often fails. It simply and logically explains some of the Earth's most profound mysteries. We can see on our planet 25 major features that can now be systematically explained as a consequence of a global flood that erupted from subterranean chambers with an energy release exceeding the explosion of 30 trillion hydrogen bombs. This theory shows us just how rapidly major mountains form. It explains the coal, oil, and methane deposits, the rapid continental drift, and why the ocean, on the ocean floor there are huge trenches, hundreds of canyons, and tens of thousands of volcanoes. This theory also explains the ice ages, and it gives the primary reason for global warming. It explains the formation of the layered strata and almost all fossils, the frozen mammoths, and major land canyons, especially the Grand Canyon. Surprisingly, it explains the origin of, of comets, of asteroids, and of meteorites. According to Dr. Brown's theory, the ancient world that Noah lived in was very different from the Earth we occupy today. Noah and other pre-flood people probably lived on one very large supercontinent with lush vegetation, inland seas, and major rivers. The mountains were smaller than today's, perhaps 6,000 feet high. Before the flood, about half the Earth's water was in interconnected chambers. About 10 miles below the Earth's surface, this formed a thin spherical shell, almost a mile thick. The pressure in the subterranean chamber had been increasing for centuries because the gravity of the sun and moon produced tides in the subterranean water that lifted and lowered the Earth's massive crust twice a day. This tidal pumping added gigantic amounts of, of energy to the subterranean water. This increasing pressure in the subterranean water steadily stretched the crust as a, as a balloon stretches when the pressure inside increases. Failure in the crust began as a microscopic crack that grew in both directions at almost three miles per second. The crack, following the path of least resistance, encircled the globe in about two hours. As the crack raced around the earth, the overlying rock crust opened up like a rip in a tightly stretched cloth. So the water exploded violently out of the rupture. The Bible even gives us a precise date the 600th year of Noah's life on the 17th day of the second month. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open. Then it says, and the rain fell. The fountains of water jetted supersonically into and above the atmosphere. The spray from these enormous fountains produced torrential rain such as the earth has never experienced before or after. The supersonic fountains eroded the crumbling rock on both sides of the widening crack. This produced huge volumes of sediments that settled through the floodwaters, trapping and burying plants and animals, forming the fossil record. Eventually, the crack became so wide that the newly exposed floor of the subterranean chamber sprung upward, giving birth to the mid-oceanic ridge that wraps around the Earth like the seam of a baseball. The continental plates, with lubricating water still beneath them, slid downhill away from the rising mid-Atlantic ridge. After the massive, slowly accelerating continental plates reached speeds of approximately 40 to 50 miles per hour, they ran into resistances, and like a runaway crashing train, they compressed, crushed, buckled, and thickened, rising out of the floodwaters. This is why the major mountains are generally parallel to the oceanic ridges from which they slid. Today's major mountains were all pushed up in hours. The hydroplates in sliding away from the mid-Atlantic ridge opened up very deep ocean basins into which the floodwaters retreated. 
This theory of a massive worldwide catastrophe in antiquity appears to support the biblical story of the deluge in every detail. But what other evidence exists to support this amazing theory? In 1970, I predicted that large pools of salt water would be found beneath major mountains. That prediction has been confirmed in several ways, by, by gravity studies, by seismic studies, and by electromagnetic studies. A paper published in the April 2001 issue of Science Magazine announced the discovery of an electrically conductive layer under the Tibetan Plateau. The article suggested that such high conductivity at depths of approximately 10 miles could be achieved by a layer of aqueous fluids, some 1.6 kilometers thick and containing 10% brine. In other words, salt water. Just how big these subterranean layers of water will turn out to be, no one really knows. But the article points out that the conductivity is evident across the entire Tibetan plateau. Recently, even more evidence to support Dr. Brown's theory became available. On March 22, 1998, a group of boys playing basketball in Monahans, Texas, narrowly missed being struck by a three-pound meteorite that crashed to the ground 40 feet from where they were playing. The police were notified, and 48 hours later, NASA scientists cracked the meteorite open in a clean room laboratory. What they discovered inside stunned them all. The meteorites contained salt crystals and liquid water. The NASA scientists who investigated this meteorite believe it came from an asteroid. That's unlikely, because asteroids in the vacuum of space cannot sustain liquid water, which is required to form salt crystals. It's also too cold, and there's too little gravity. Earth is the only body in the solar system that can sustain liquid water on its surface. This demonstrates the enormous power of the subterranean supercritical water, the fountains of the great deep that launch water and rock fragments into orbit around the sun. These rock fragments are still returning to the Earth as meteorites. Meteorites contain Earth-like material, including many types of living but dormant bacteria. This means that meteorites and their bacteria didn't originate in the vacuum of space. Meteorites are literally tiny chunks of the Earth itself returning home. Scientists are also scratching their heads over another recent discovery. On the Kola Peninsula in northern Russia, they have created the world's deepest hole, extending to a depth of 7.5 miles. At this depth, what they expected to find was a layer of basalt, Earth's most common type of volcanic rock what they actually discovered was something entirely different. The hole didn't reach the basalt underlying the granite continents, but to everyone's surprise, they did reach hot, salty water flowing through crushed granite. Geologists are mystified, but the hydroplate theory provides a simple explanation. Did the springs of the great deep burst forth and flood the entire earth, just as the Bible says? Dr. Brown's hydroplate theory offers us a plausible scientific explanation for how this may have happened. But is there something more important to this theory? Could it be yet another example of the supernatural engineering observed throughout the Bible? If we now know where the water of the Great Flood came from, the same water that was instrumental in forming the fossil record, then when the Great Flood receded, where did all the water go? The answer to that question not only bolsters the scientific theory that a worldwide flood actually took place, it also provides an alternative explanation for the formation of one of the world's greatest natural wonders. This is the question that stops most scientific investigators dead in their tracks. Yet the hydroplate theory makes the answer obvious. As the hydroplates crashed, they thickened and rose out of the water, forcing the flood waters over the continents to recede. Simultaneously, upward surging subterranean water was choked off. As the flood water drained off the continents, every continental basin was left brimful of water, producing many post-flood lakes. During the following centuries, some lakes breached their boundaries by either spilling over their rims or undercutting their banks. The rapid catastrophic discharge of these lakes, much like the collapse of a large dam, carved canyons. Several centuries after the flood, two very large ancient lakes, Grand Lake and Hopi Lake, sitting on top of the high rising Colorado Plateau, breached their boundaries and carved the Grand Canyon in just a few weeks.
The massive canyon was not carved by the relatively small Colorado River over millions of years. That river is a consequence of the carving of the Grand Canyon. Can the residual waters of Noah's flood account for the amazing natural beauty of the Grand Canyon? If Dr. Brown's theory is correct, then the Grand Canyon was carved only a few thousand years ago, and nearly every geology textbook needs to be rewritten. One has only to look at the Earth's anomalies to see that the hydroplate theory provides a far better explanation of the Earth's present condition than the other more prevalent, well-propagated, but highly implausible theories. Were key geological markers like the Grand Canyon formed over millions of years? Or did they come to be within the short time frame of Noah's flood? The hydroplate theory, which supports the story of Noah's flood, says it was the latter. If that is true, what better example of supernatural engineering could one ask for?